Hello, everybody. Welcome to the 10th Death Side Talk with Mark. I'm Mark, and today we're going to be talking about just some random topics on board gaming. Going to be talking about how I've been organizing my life, which is something I've been interested in lately to try to become more organized and procrastinate less. I'm going to talk a little bit about Vast the Crystal Caverns, which is an A game I missed when it came out a year or two ago and got a review copy of to review the expansion. And I don't know when that review is coming out simply because the game is so unusual and so so unlike any other game I've ever played that I'm having a hard time evaluating it. And I feel like I don't, even after playing it a couple times, I don't have any clue of what this game is going to look like on my 10th play. And, you know, that's one of the things I look at when I'm reviewing game is, do I have a good projection of how the game's still going to play once I get more into it? And with Vast, it's it's just an odd one. So I'll talk about that. And then I'm going to do talk briefly about how rule books are written, which is something I've been seeing lately in the last couple of days on Twitter. A lot of discussion about gender-neutral pronouns in rule books and I want to give my two cents on that. But let's start with organizing my life, which again, as I said just a second ago, is something I've been really focused on the last couple of weeks when I saw some people talking about how they organize their time. I'm notoriously a procrastinator and tend to put things off and not organize well. I I can't write well with kind of a set schedules. I write when I'm able to write, and I do things when I'm able to do them. And so I've kind of always put off the idea of having an organizational system because I figure that's just not how I work. And every time I did look into it, it was it seemed like so much work just to set up the system itself that I didn't understand the time benefit of it. But uh, recently I heard about, I can't remember the name of it, Get Things Done, GTD, I think that's the name of it, which is some organizational system and... People were were saying good things about it, and I looked at it, and I figured, well, it's just going to be one of these bloated systems that someone's shilling. And while, from what I understand, there is a whole giant subsystem with all kinds of symbiology and stuff, the, the general principle of it is that if you write down everything that you need to do and need to remember, you don't have to spend any brain power remembering. So you basically export that brain power onto a list and then you don't have to worry about remembering things actively and that makes complete sense to me so i've said okay what's the simplest quickest easiest way i can implement this i found a program or an app called todoist which i'm not even using half of the features on it i'm only using it to write down lists of things that i need to do and it's just a digital checklist and That's the system I've been using the past couple of weeks, and it's worked fairly well. I think I'm able to get more things done. I don't worry as much about trying to remember the things I have. I'm working on getting into the habit of as soon as I think of something, I write it down. And if I don't do that, it's gone. So I have to write it down on my to-doist list. So if you are a person like me who procrastinates and forgets things and is bad with lists thinking of it in terms of exporting the work from your mind onto the list and just doing it as simple as possible has worked out fairly well for me i think it's a success and i'm going to continue doing it moving on to vast as i said before this is a very strange game if you haven't heard of it it is sort of a dungeon crawler it it's riffing on the dungeon crawl genre although I wouldn't call the game itself a dungeon crawl. The twist to the game, the the hook, is that each player plays a very different part of the dungeon crawl genre. So there's one person who's the knight who's going in to try to defeat the dragon. The dragon is trying to wake up and escape the cave. The, the There's someone who controls a group of goblins who are trying to kill the knight, I believe. And there's a thief who just wants to steal treasure. And then the fifth player is the cave itself, who is trying to essentially delay the game until it can 
collapse the cave onto the other players. And that's the full game with five players. And you can play with fewer numbers, and it works out pretty well. We played a three-player game that seemed great, actually. I wouldn't go two players. Maybe it'll work out well, but I think three to five is probably ideal. Each one of these roles is so radically asymmetrical that I'd say a good 80% of the rules are specific to the roles. So there are some basic rules about how you explore the cave. But most of the rules are just going to be handed to the individual players and they learn their role, which works all right. It works as a learning game to just basically read your role and figure out that and not worry about everything else and kind of pick up the important parts of what they're able to do as you go. But it certainly feels like a learning game because sometimes something will happen. You're like, oh, I had no idea they could do that or they even cared about that. So it's kind of a strange rules burden that you need to kind of understand how all the roles interact. And that plays that that factors into playing the game well, because in this game, more than any other game I've played, each other player is kind of a clock on the game. And because they each have their own asymmetric win condition that will trigger the end of the game immediately, there's no set of end of the game, everyone needs to take a part in teaming up on whoever is closest to winning the game and hindering them once there's a point where someone pulls out ahead. So you have your specific win condition and your specific goal. If you start to fall behind... There's a lot of diplomacy that needs to happen to make sure that the person who has the momentum doesn't just stay ahead and then win. Because most of the win conditions are actually all the win conditions in the base game that I can remember are very incremental and ticking down. So it's like, you know, if you're trying to kill the dragon and he starts with eight health, you just have to do eight hits on the dragon. Like it's just eight individual points. So it's very easy to see how far someone is towards their goal. And my fear is that a game of Vast is just ultimately always going to reduce to that kind of basic diplomatic game. But having said that, so far it's been a fascinating learning experience in trying to figure out how to play your role right. So far in all of both of our games we played, I've played a three player and a five player. The Knight has won fairly easily. But we realized afterwards that we were just not doing enough to hinder the knight. And the knight has kind of won the most straightforward role in, in the game. I, I think it's probably the simplest to play, and it's pretty straightforward. And once it gets enough power, which it's gaining throughout uh, the early part of the game, it's very hard to stop the knight. So you have to understand that and try to slow the knight down in the early parts of the game while he's weak, or while she's weak, rather. And so I think it'll be a great game once we understand kind of the nuances of the characters and how some of them are more difficult. The cave seems very difficult because they're trying to slow down everyone and actually extend the length of the game. Because as you explore the cave, you're adding tiles to the board, Carcassonne style. And once you hit, once you get through all of the tiles, the cave starts collapsing. And that's where the cave wins if if it's able to collapse enough tiles. So it's trying to prohibit everyone else from winning ultimately until it can collapse enough. So it's like its own timer on the game, trying to extend that. The other players are all individually trying to shorten the game by winning before everyone else. It's a very bizarre system. It looks great. Uh, They sent me the miniatures expansion, which has little plastic minis for everything. Even in the base game, there were a lot of component redundancies, which I found bizarre. So they'd have like wooden pieces for something, but also they have cardboard pieces for the same thing based on your preference. And then the minis expansion adds some plastic mini stuff for, for, for part of it. So for, I think like the crystal components, we have three different sets of components for this one piece in the game, uh, which is very generous of them, but seems a little bit excessive But regardless, it's done about as well as I can think of visually. The the, the art is nice. The design is very well done in that 
everything significant to you is color coded to your color. So like everything significant to the cave player is shaded purple. Everything significant to the goblin player is, is green, even the cards and everything. So it's fairly easy to kind of map out what components people need to pay attention to. The rule book is written really well as you're like reading through it, but there there's a lot that's left out of it. Once you start playing that has bothered us in that there's, there's a lot of rule things. We're not quite sure if we're doing it right, just because it's not mentioned in the rules. It's implied in many cases. All in all, I'm interested in playing a lot more vast. We haven't even touched the expansion characters or even just the expansion cards that provide more cards. Although I think next time I'm going to try to just to try to play around with that. Cause ostensibly that's what I'm supposed to be reviewing, but I think it's going to take a number of plays of Vast in order to settle on my opinion for a review. I'm cautiously optimistic, but again, I'm afraid the game will reduce to a very basic cosmic encounter-like diplomacy negotiation system. And in a game that's that seems like it's trying to be something more than that, that would be a little bit disappointing. But I'm excited to play the expansion characters, which look really interesting, and play around with all the different systems because it's it's just massively robust in all the different character combinations you can do and the roles and the strategy and how they interact with each other. So that'll be one to look out for, although I think it's going to take a while before I get a review out just because it's such an unusual game. The final thing I wanted to talk about is gender-neutral pronouns in rule books, which apparently gets a lot of heat. I don't understand it. And I think the issue is that people want to defend the kind of universal he pronoun as the, as the standard, even though that doesn't make a lot of sense just to the common person, because it's clearly a gendered pronoun. And to defend that, they use this kind of prescriptivist, oh, that is quote-unquote proper grammar, even though it hasn't been something we do when we speak in grammar for many, many years. We've, we've accepted the singular they pronoun in speech ever since I can remember in, in my lifetime, and it simply works well. There aren't that many cases where there's ambiguity, you can easily write around the ambiguity in, in a written context, and it gets away with the gendered pronoun issue. It's, it's such an elegant and easy solution. It's already the way we speak that I think people are jumping on the prescriptivist grammar train just to try to defend it because they like it better for whatever reason. And I think it's incredibly difficult to hold on to a firm pres prescriptivist argument for grammar. And it's ultimately not going to be an issue within the next five years. I think all rule books will start being written that way. It's just odd to see that there's an argument about this so fervently in some board game circles. I don't understand it at all. The singular they is part of American English. It's the same thing with like ending sentences with prepositions. We all end sentences with prepositions and it's just a random rule. If I remember correctly, it's, it's some rule that a group of stodgy grammarians tried to make official based on Latin grammar, even though it's not used in English. And I'm a little bit of a stickler for certain, you know, slang and everyone's going to be a stickler in that sense. But Ultimately, grammar is going to keep progressing and evolving based on how we write and, and talk overall. Like, grammar is always going to be a descriptivist thing, and you can't really hold on too tightly to certain norms you're used to. There are certain things I think you can make the argument for that it's valuable that we hold on to how things were before rather than how things are going. For instance, I think it's important to understand the difference between disinterest and uninterest because being disinterested is, is an important concept that is hard to phrase without that specific word and distinction between disinterest and uninterest. So I think that's important. I think keeping the 
logical, and by logical I mean the, the definition in formalized logic of begging the question is important because we don't have an alternative phrase that precisely means what begging the question means in logic. And it, and it doesn't mean that it incentivizes a question. There's, there's alternatives to how we use the phrase begging the question colloquially that we can use easily instead of taking this phrase from logic or this, this fallacy from logic and using it for that purpose. So those are things I think you can make reasonable arguments that we should try to use them, you know, quote unquote, properly. But I haven't seen any argument you can make for using he as a as a gen as a gender neutral pronoun or like a standard universal pronoun like that that makes any sense. So we should just use they. It if you can think of an argument for the the he one that doesn't rely on grammatical ambiguities that are easily written around, then I'd love to hear it because I've never seen one. Anyway, that's my rantings and ramblings for today. Next week, we'll be back with a full-length podcast where we will be comparing a couple of games. We haven't settled on it yet, but it's going to be an in-depth discussion comparing two games of a similar genre. I think it'll be a good one. Don't forget to rate and review this podcast on iTunes. Check me out on social media and at thethoughtfulgamer.com if you do enjoy the podcast and want to help out. We're still looking for a little bit more funding on Patreon to get into the black for 2018, just a little bit more per month. If you do enjoy the podcast, consider pitching in there at patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer. I'll talk to you all soon. Goodbye.